without further ado, I'm going to invite Holly um, to come up and speak to us um, this morning. She's going to carry on our series. There we go. Welcome, Holly. Shall I pray for you? It's probably a good idea. <laughs> yeah, Father God, we thank you for Holly. We thank you for um, who she is. Thank you that she is a daughter of yours, that she's loved uh, with an unconditional, never-ending, uh, never-failing love. And uh, I pray that uh, Holly might know that this morning. And um, through in that, in that position of being loved, that she might speak to us and share something that um, impacts our hearts um, through your spirit this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Thanks, Deb. Yeah, good morning. Um, this is the third talk in our one and two Timothy series called Fighting the Good Fight. If you missed the first two, I really recommend a listen to those online at highgrove.church. Lara gave a really good introduction overview and Ed said some really practical things about how finance features in our discipleship. This morning it's me and I'm focusing on um, Paul's instructions to Timothy to train in godliness. I think there's a real challenge for us in these passages, but also a real prom promise of blessing. And um, yeah, God, I'm just going to pray. God, would you please help us hear Paul's message to Timothy in a way that applies to us? Because we run after so many things. We invest in so many things. But the best thing to invest in, Lord, is our relationship with you. Amen. There's two passages that we're looking at in particular this morning. The first is from 1 Timothy chapter 4, 7 to 10. It says, have nothing to do with godless myths and old wives' tales. Rather, train yourself to be godly. For physical training is of some value, but godliness has value for all things, holding promise for both the present life and the life to come. This is a trustworthy saying that deserves full acceptance. That is why we labor and strive, because we have put our hope in the living God, who is the savior of all people, and especially of those who believe. Paul says, train yourself to be godly. What is godliness? I think it's a bit of a funny word. <laughs> it means the quality or practice of following God. To live in a godly way is to reflect the nature of God's kingdom in our everyday life. So to train in godliness means to develop our character, to reflect God's character, what God is like. You might have noticed that Paul contrasts godly training with physical training in both his letters to Timothy and elsewhere. Paul and Timothy would likely have seen the Isthmian Games in Corinth. It was a bit like the Olympic Games. Athletes from throughout Greece would go every two years at springtime and descend upon that area. And Paul was probably at the Games of AD 51. He might have even had work fixing and selling tents to people that would have stayed in the nearby land because there was no fixed accommodation for them. Anyway, they would train to compete in foot races, wrestling and boxing, amongst other events. And these athletes took an oath to abide by the rules of the Games. If they broke the oath, they were disqualified. And unlike the modern Olympics, where there's gold, silver, bronze for the first three places, in the ancient Greek games, only the winner received the crown, which was a wreath made of leaves. <laughs> Salary leaves, apparently. There's no second place award. Winning the crown was everything. And this is the epitaph of a boxer named Agathus Diamond from Alexandria, found on a monument in Olympia in Greece, it said this, here he died, boxing in the stadium, having prayed to Zeus for a wreath or death. Age 35, farewell. <laughs> yeah, he went for the gold and he died trying to win it. That's certainly not the attitude that I had last week at the school sports day parents race. <laughs> I was not in it to win it, and one of my children has made it abundantly clear that I will not be forgiven for coming last for all eternity. <laughs> but this serious, all-or-nothing attitude to winning that these Greek athletes had is the attitude that Paul applied to his life with Jesus Christ. Nothing else mattered more than training to finish his race well. All else he counted loss. He wanted nothing to disqualify him in getting to the finish line. 
He uses the same idea when writing to the church in Corinth about their need for self-discipline. He says, do you not know that in a race all the runners run, but only one gets the prize? Run in such a way as to get the prize. Everyone who competes in the games goes into strict training. They do it to get a crown that will not last, but we do it to get a crown that will last forever. Therefore, I do not run like someone running aimlessly. I do not fight like a boxer beating the air. Paul knew the value of godliness. It's valuable to be godly. Paul says it's got value for all things. That is in every way, in every area of our lives. Our attitudes, our speech, our work ethic, our finances, our relationships, everything. Our spiritual exercise is valuable in two ways, he says, in the present life and in the life to come. It's got benefit for both our lives now and into eternity. And the second bit from 2 Timothy that we're looking at, it's like a reminder to keep going after godliness. 2 Timothy 2, 4 to 7. No one serving as a soldier gets entangled in civilian affairs, but rather tries to please his commanding officer. Similarly, anyone who competes as an athlete does not receive the victor's crown except by competing according to the rules. The hardworking farmer should be the first to receive a share of the crops. Reflect on what I am saying, for the Lord will give you insight into all this. And reflecting on these words of Paul, I think there are four steps that will give punch, if you like, to a good training plan in godliness. The first is this, be proactive. Maybe you've played a sport or studied a course or had on-the-job training where you've had to really apply yourself and pay attention to learn new skills. And before you started, you had to be proactive. You made a choice to train. You weighed up the cost and you tried to understand what it would require from you. Sacrifices may have been made in how you spent your time. You don't just amble into training. You decide to do it. In the verses we just read, the soldier chose to be ready to receive the instructions. The athlete chose to enter the games. The farmer decided what he should grow. Consider when your best times are for investing in your relationship with God, whether that's private prayer or reading the Bible, however long or short those times are. Choose to make those moments a training opportunity. Choose what next step you can make, whether it's visiting small group for the first time, committing to regular worship, here on a Sunday, or trying at the new Bible app. If you can, it might mean a choice to set your wake-up time 10 minutes earlier. But as I was praying for you all this morning, I felt it was really important to say this for someone. Um, Training plans sometimes need to change. (laughs) They can be adapted. And I just felt it was important to say the season of life that you are in is not a barrier to being able to grow in and change and have the power of God at work in your life. Um, When I became a mum, set apart quiet time just went out the window (laughs) together with decent sleep. And um, my training plan no longer fit. (laughs) It really didn't. And I kind of thought and felt like my spiritual life was on hold. But looking back on that time now, I can see how God showed me new opportunities like reflecting on a single verse, um, a promise of God I had stuck on the fridge that I'd try and change every now and then. Um, And I took in scripture through having worship music on, whether it was kids' worship or adult stuff. It was just, that was a way that the word of God was still enriching my life. And God probably taught me to to pray more simply. (laughs) Prayers like, help me, be with me now, Jesus. And were those prayers any less valuable to my Father in heaven? I don't think so. (laughs) I think he loves hearing from us and being able to speak to us and meet with us all the time. He loves you in the season that you are in, whatever it is. So if you are in a tough season where it feels hard to be proactive, perhaps pray. Ask God, what does this season offer for me to draw close, close to you, Lord? And if this is new to you and you're not sure what you could do as a next step to living a godly life, I'm really happy to chat with you or one of the other leaders will be really happy to chat with you about that too. My second point is make it a priority. In order to benefit from training, you make it a priority in your life. The soldier remained really focused and avoided distractions because his priority was to carry out the orders of his commanding officer. And Paul's point is that we should prioritize pleasing God and following his instruction. 
My husband is a great example of someone who has unwavering focus in what he chooses to prioritise. And when we were teenagers, he really wanted to do well in his A-levels and get the university place he wanted. And I, so he was really committed to his study, and I did not realise quite how committed to that study he was until I came to ask him out. Finally had the moment, <laughs> Rob, will you go out with me? And this is what he said, no. <laughs> At the moment, I want to focus on my studies. What kind of guy says that? <laughs> Well, as it turned out, the kind of guy who was wise and committed and exactly the guy that I wanted to marry. <laughs> I still admire his ability to prioritise. If training in godliness means becoming more like Jesus, then are our priorities reflecting that desire? Does it affect how we shape our days, our weeks, the pattern of our life? Are we choosing to prioritise spending time with Jesus, reading his words, praying, praising him, taking time to enjoy his presence? Paul knew godliness mattered into eternity. What one thing will you prioritise this week, this year, that will matter most to you in 10 years' time, in eternity? At this point, I thought I would invite up a couple of wonderful people to share how they exercise their spiritual fitness. Thank you so much, Sharon. Let's give them a clap. <laughs> and Rachel, thank you. And baby Elise. So we've got three questions for these guys. I'll give you a mic. I'm going to ask three questions, and you can both take it and turn to ask, answer them. Is that okay? What key thing do you do to keep yourself spiritually fit? Okay, well, I kind of thought about this, and um, actually, I think what has really helped me over the last year or so is to take some time out. So I've just come back from um, a Christian retreat, actually. It's called Fold of Brennan, which is Sheepfold of the King in Pembrokeshire in West Wales, and it was absolutely beautiful. And what I really found was the, the real rhythm of prayer um, each day was just really, really, really helpful. Um, and they've got this kind of cross on, on the hillside, which you can go down, and it's, it's a real beautiful, beautiful place. It's right in the middle of the hills. Um, and Psalm 23 is very significant in that whole kind of um, place, actually. Retreat's been prayed over it a lot. And God really zapped me. He basically, um, when I walked down to the cross um, and walked back a little bit, he just said, lie down. And I just basically lay down on, this, on the grass. And about two or three hours later, I sort of woke up. And I just really feel that he wanted to basically, um, literally allow me to lie down in green pastures and, and restore my soul. So for me, having retreats uh, is something that's really helpful. As um, Holly was saying, becoming a mum, it can be hard to set aside chunks of time. Um, but I find that in the morning, the first thing I do is commit the day to God. So kind of walk through my day and anything that I'm kind of anxious about, commit that to God. And then at the end of the day, I specifically list everything that God's done for me and like thank him for each thing. And it just helps me to keep focus that every good thing I have comes from God. And um, yeah, just having those specific times, I know even if the day is full, I have those two times to pray. That's a really powerful thing to do, practicing thankfulness, yeah, and getting times of rest. Thank you. Second question is, <laughs> oh, there it is. What most helps you to train in godliness with other people? So maybe small yeah, group or church, group. those contexts. Yes. Um, okay, so for this one, I was thinking about it, and I think... What's really helping me over the last few years is to go to Bible Study Fellowship. Um, and this is a group that's kind of international. Um, and I go on a Tuesday morning and I meet with a group of people, a group of ladies actually. And they have this really excellent way of kind of studying the Bible, which is a fourfold kind of way of, of, of learning. So they give you some, they basically usually do like um, a book a, a year, an academic year. And so they'll give you um, the bit of scripture and you've got questions to answer. And then after that, you go to the group on the Tuesday morning and you discuss the questions. Then you listen to a lecture. And then after that, um, you get some commentary. So I find this is a really good way, because I'm not very good at remembering scripture or actually sort of doing scripture on a regular basis. So I find this a really good way to focus and to actually hopefully remember some of the scripture that I've So getting been, together with other people, with other people. and people. talking yeah. about the scripture Absolutely. that you've been reading to apply yes. it and yeah. wrestle with it and go, and it's what really, does this mean? We just did um, 
the book of Matthew, I think that's right. And you kind of think a lot of the verse is quite familiar, but actually the group, the discussion of the ladies were absolutely amazing and how much deeper they sort of dug. And that mm. kind of struck with me some of the um, fresh things that kind of came, came to reading Matthew. Yeah. Thank you. Um, for me, it's being involved in small group and like soul space and just a place to be honest with what's going on in your life. Um, we can sometimes find it easy to just say that everything's fine, but actually being honest about struggles and getting prayer for it. Mm. And I find that not only helps me when I'm receiving prayer, but also it's a great testimony for other people when they see prayers are answered. So just encouraging each other and on our journeys. Thank you. Soul Space is a group that ordinarily would meet here on a Tuesday morning for women. Through the summer, we're going to be going for walks and stuff with all our kids. <laughs> You're still welcome to join us. Um, question three. Do you have a current favourite resource you use? Hmm. That you, uh, yeah. Yeah, I've been using Lectio 365 for a couple of years, actually, a few years, and I find that really, really helpful. That's kind of Pete Gregg's thing. I don't know whether anybody knows it. You can get it, download your app on the phone. And it's only about 10 minutes in the morning. And recently, about a year and a half ago, they've done an evening slot as well. So that's been really, really helpful to go to bed and put this um, really reflective. So in the morning, it tends to focus on prayer. It's an, and so it's pause to be still, rejoice, um, with a, rejoice with the psalm and, and reflect, ask God to help us and others, and then yield to his will. And then at night, it's very much a reflection to rejoice, repent, and rest. And I do find that really allows me to go through the day, really sort of be thankful, you know, even in our most difficult days. There's usually something we can be thankful for, and then that helps me sort of rest at night. Um, yeah, so we always have Christian radio on in the car and I find that it's really helpful no matter what is going on if it's been a manic like morning at least having like scripture come through the radio and worship songs and yeah just spending my journey time like being able to worship um, yeah it can be hard to commit chunks of time throughout the day to that but just having it on in the car I find really helpful in listening to bible verses on that Thank you both so much for sharing. Yeah. Thanks for those examples of how we can work on our spiritual fitness, both on our own, because Paul says, train yourself, but also publicly with other people. It's so good to receive that encouragement and have other people to do it with small groups, D groups, Sunday mornings. All right, I've got two more points. The third one is keep practicing. Training develops us, it progresses us from one stage to the next. And Paul said that the athlete follows the rules in order to succeed. In other words, an athlete that doesn't follow the rules isn't going to get anywhere. And I think his point was that we are to obey God's word in order to grow in godliness. We progress by practice. The more we exercise our spiritual fitness muscles and practice our faith, the more we grow in it. If you want to grow in your prayer life, set aside time to pray. If you want to grow an understanding of God's word and his teaching, offer to lead a small group study with your small group. If you want to practice the prophetic, practice as you're praying with your D group. Practicing godliness brings peace. In Hebrews 12, 11, no, dis no discipline seems pleasant at the time, but painful. Later on, however, it produces a harvest of righteousness and peace for those who have been trained by it. On a journey um, that my family and I made from, the U from New Zealand to the UK, our airport to stopover to refuel the plane was Osaka International Airport in Japan. And this airport has been built out into the sea a bit, I think, to maximise on space. So as you're coming down as a passenger, you, we couldn't see the runway. You could just see sea. And we were coming in in a really big storm. And the pilot said, it's going to be a bumpy landing. You know, prepare for a bumpy landing. It's going to be OK. <laughs> so we're all quite nervous looking at each other or not <laughs> um, as the plane was, was coming down to land. And at the last moment, the pilot brought the plane back up, banked the plane, which way you go right over on the side. And the sea <laughs> was just way too close. And his voice comes through, sorry, guys, it's too windy. We'll circle around and we'll try that again. This happened several times, and I will never forget the 
applause that went through the cabin when we finally landed safely <laughs> on the runway in appreciation for that pilot. That was probably not his best day at work, <laughs> but I bet he was thankful for the training that he'd put in. And it's like that for us in life. The, when the turbulent and testing times come, our training and godliness will help us withstand the storms. Training habits form deeper foundations that help us stand strong in our faith and navigate our way forward wisely. It's why Paul wrote, put on the full armor of God so that when the day of evil comes, you may be able to stand your ground and having done everything to stand. Ephesians 6.13 and the fourth point, partner with the Holy Spirit. In everything else that's gone before that I've said, we need this one to go with all of it. It's not about a tick list, it's about transformation. To speak of godliness only as the product of our hard work and training makes it sound like something that we alone can make happen. It isn't. It's our training efforts together with God's empowering that work to transform us. Let's not misdirect our efforts or get too proud of ourselves. It's not just about how many minutes you spend praying or the number of verses that you read or badges that you earn on a Bible app. It's about the transformative power of a life lived with Jesus. If we have a training routine at all, the point of it is to put ourselves in the best position we can whenever we can. God to work in us. I really love a description that explains this really well to me. It's by John Ortberg, and he says this. He's describing us as a, as a sailboat and God as the wind. We can hoist the sails and steer the rudder, but we are utterly dependent on the wind. The wind does the work. Our task is to do whatever enables us to catch the wind. Our training is about putting ourselves in the position to be transformed by God, to live, live lives that really do reflect our hope in the living God who is our saviour. So I'm going to pray for us now. <laughs> Holy God, we love you and we, we desire to live lives that reflect who you are to people that we live with, the people we encounter at work. And we know that to grow more like you, we need to spend more time in your company, reading your word, praising you, doing the things that help us to, to reflect your character, to grow more in your character. And Lord, we invite your Holy Spirit now. Would you help us? Would you meet with us in these times that we set aside for you? We want to be a church who really show your love, Lord Jesus. And we need your help. Amen.